Hi, welcome to today's Change Ignition podcast. Today, I'm really excited um, to be speaking with Paul Gibbons. So Charlotte and I are going to be having a conversation with Paul. And Paul is an author, speaker and consultant. His beat is helping business leaders use science and philosophy to make better strategic decisions, implement change, innovate, change culture and create workplaces where talent flourishes. His most recent book, The Science of Organizational Change, has been hailed as the most important book on change in 15 years. Between writing projects, he consults, coaches, and speaks with businesses such as Microsoft, Google, HSBC, KPMG, and Comcast. So today's topic is the future of change. So welcome, Paul. Hello. I've got Hi. to remember that you're recording video, so I was making funny faces at Charlotte while we were doing it, so I won't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> when, I hear people, when I hear people reading my bio, I always think how this surreal experience is all factual or anything like that. It almost sounds to me like it ought to be someone else. But anyway. It's you. <laughs> here. I'm in the Rockies, by the way. I'm in Colorado. I don't know if you know. I'm... Uh, about four kilometers from the Rocky Mountains. Fantastic. So, so America is flat as a pancake from here all the way until you get to the Appalachian Mountains on the East Coast. So about two and a half thousand miles of the most unbelievably flat country in the world. And all of a sudden there's this big gash in the earth right behind me. And the Rockies go on for 800 kilometers to the west till you get to California almost. Yeah. So that's where I'm at. Fantastic. <laughs> And we're in sunny Perth in Western <laughs> Australia, so on the edge of the Indian Ocean. Very um, cool. Very so cool. I, I, want very I want to come out and play with you guys sometime. Anyway. <laughs> anyway that'll be nice. Fantastic. So, Paul, one of the topics that's certainly um, really current in Australia is the future of change management. And I know you've got a, a, a view on this. Um, having read your book, um, you put forward some really great ideas. So... Tell us more about the future of change management. Uh, you know, I've kind of said provocatively in the book that um, change management, you know, ought to be euthanized. Oh, I'm such a bit of a drama today. So I don't want to put anybody out of a job because obviously that doesn't mean all of a sudden that businesses are super good at changing. Mm. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's not, we've not arrived there. I mean, I think it was unheard of. Change management was more or less unheard of in the early 1990s when I yeah. first became a consultant. They were doing organization development stuff in the 60s, national mm. training laboratories and all that stuff in the Tavistock Institute in England and some very rich established things. But change management um, is, is newish. And it was a good thing when it, when it came because um, the reason I got into it was we used to do strategy projects and... Uh, they didn't do anything. I mean, you know, they just say, oh, this is brilliant. Thank you very much for your recommendations. We'll take it under consideration. And then, uh, you know, they used to sign the checks and we'd bugger off and they, you know, they'd take the report and I don't know, holy water on it or something and nothing would happen. I was really disappointed. I was really mm -hmm. amazed um, because in my naivete, and I think my naivete is representative of a lot of senior sort of rational business dudes was that if you had good enough reasons, a good enough business case, a good enough economic justification, everything would fall into line and the change would just yeah. kind of, you know, slot in all the bits of the pieces would come together. So that doesn't happen. So here we are about two, two and a half decades later and, um, and there's a, a relatively well-developed canon of change management tools. Mm. There's lots, you know, tens of thousands of people on LinkedIn talking about change management, dozens and dozens of very, very good books. It doesn't, it doesn't, not so good. Um, and um, and uh, so we, we have developed some robust ideas um, about what you need to do to align the people side of organization. And some of those are inherited from our brethren from National Training Laboratories and the Tavistock Institute and Group Dynamics and all of that. And then, and then some of them are from the management consultant project management phase. We've kind of swept the kind of people side of project management slightly under our canon, stakeholder management. So we've anyway, there's a robust canon there anyway. And so if you want to cast change management in a very um, blunt 
you know, oversimplistic way. You want to, you know, in, align the, or, the people in the organization. You want them motivated. You want them to understand the change. You want them to understand the big picture. You want them to be able to motivate their people. You want to resolve conflict within stakeholders. You want to um, decide what sort, what the new culture might ought to be in the organization. You want to communicate the change in both ways. So these are the, the family of things you want to do. And then as I was uh, writing the book, I thought to myself, bloody hell, isn't that what like a good leader? If you imagine like in your mm -hmm. mind, like the best leader you can imagine, right? I mean, the best. When a big change, if he's leading change locally, some big change from above. You know, frequently change managers will got brought in. I used to, this was my change management. Will you come in and sprinkle some pixie dust on, on us? Because, you know, people are leaving, people are upset. We're not getting the work done. We're not getting the technical requirements done. This group won't talk to that group. We're three weeks behind and it looks like it's going to be, you know, can you come in, Mr. Change Person, and do something about all that, all that people guff that's mm. going on? And, and it just strikes me that in a perfect world, if you had a perfect leader, they'd be a hell of a lot better at doing that than they now are, is they would understand the big picture and they would make sense of it for their people. And they would communicate how their people were doing the change upward. And they would inspire and motivate and align. And if people were recalcitrant or difficult or finding it un difficult emotionally, they'd have some kind of skills to help people adjust and make sense of things. And if there was a conflict between how the change hit their department and other departments, well, they'd be skillful in having those fierce conversations with one another and all that. So this picture, this is a fantasy, of course, of some guy <laughs> really super duper good. Well, you know, they, you know, I've met some people who are pretty bloody good, yeah. you know, would we 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 wouldn't have so much work to do, right? I mean, yeah. so so that's my that was my claim that that it ought to be uninvented. You know mm. that really if we were better at educating leaders for doing the stuff that they really do day in and day out. And so you know you have the Harvard M Business School, the Harvard MBA, and as I was writing the book, I was saying you know we don't really teach business people the things that they really do day in and day out. Now I showed up to Harvard MBA and they have like, I think 11 standard modules, two year MBA, hundred thousand dollars. I don't know what they charge for it <clears throat> a lot. And, um, 11, and then they've got a bunch of electives. There's a hundred electives. I think one of them has the word change in it. Mm -hmm. out of 100. So you think, so you think, well, uh, Mr. Manager, Mrs. Manager, 45 years old, relatively senior, some sort of vice presidential thing. What are the biggest headaches they have to deal with? And almost always, if it's not 80% of their job, it's 80% of their headaches is dealing with change of one kind or another, from above, from below, from sideways. Their people are initiating, they're initiating, someone above, someone from so, so is that really represented in the business school community? It's absolutely not. You know, it's a representative specialist curricula, like you've done a master's in change management and you know, um, we haven't talked, Rob, but you, you'll have advanced kind of knowledge mm -hmm. and field mm -hmm. such as this. So why are we teaching this to, to, to people who are line managers? Because mm -hmm. that's the stuff that they have to do. So that's my future of change management. That's part of the spiel, I think. And I think then the thing that we haven't done as a world is figured out how to change behaviors properly yet. And so there's good stuff from lots of different disciplines that's not picked up by OD. Mm. And our assumption in OD tends to be, because we come from a tradition of humanistic psychology from the 1960s, which is non-coercive and it's not parental and it's not authoritarian, person-centered, Rogerian counseling, right? That's our background. That's my yeah. background. So that's the thing. So God forbid we should tell people what to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and so, and, and if you're ever, you know, done Rogerian or trained in Gestalt or something like that, you would never really, you can, you can do it. It's one of the five interventions you can have. But anyway, but let's say what you would do is normally in sense, change hearts and minds. So you'd look with, um, that was Alexa talking to me, you know, that, um, oh, yeah. was on that <laughs> just whispering sweet nothings in my ear. Uh, I'll be with you in a moment, darling. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> oh um, so, so, oh, where was I before I distracted myself with that? So we have, um, the humanistic psychology. Uh, That's what we're taught not to tell people what to do. And so who, who's heard change your insides to change your outsides? Well, we all have. 
right? That's what I was taught in psychology. That's what I was taught in lots of my personal growth stuff. Is you change your, if you know, you want to change your, your, your outside world and your environment, your behaviors, you, you get your head right. You get your head in the game. Mm. And uh, that's insufficient. I think it's insufficient. Uh, I, I, I don't even think it's necessary. Mm -hmm. And I definitely don't think it's sufficient. And why do I say it's not necessary? Is frequently you can act your way into a new way of thinking. Mm -hmm. act your way. So change your behaviors and your thoughts and feelings and attitudes and beliefs will follow that. Yeah. And I, and I think we're in an undiscovered country because I don't think the world yet... Uh, I mean, I've written an article recently, not recently, 10, 12 years ago, on the body and leadership, which is that, that at its core is that a lot of what leaders have to do is in the domain of a body. And without la launching into that, it's how do you get uh, behaviors? How do you lead with the body? How do you put your body in the right conversations and have thoughts and feelings? Well, so, for example, how to change. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I look at people out running in, when I lived in the Midwest of America. It's 30 degrees below and it's a blizzard. I see some, excuse my language, bastard out running. What in the hell are they? <laughs> what, are you what are they thinking? But the point is, you know what? They're not thinking. Mm. They're not thinking. They're out running. So in a way, this internal apparatus is not getting in the way of what's a habit for them and why they're running. This is a habit. So I think in the change world, I don't think we've thought enough about habits. Mm. And I think there's some good stuff we're learning about habit change. There's some good stuff we're learning about nudges. So the behavioral mm -hmm. insights team from England. So there's lots yeah. of good stuff. And I think as change management experts, because whatever, even if we were to get rid of that part of our job, which is about um, sprinkling the change pixie dust on projects, a lot of what we then would be doing is skills transfer to the people we would be educating We'd be educating managers and leaders in the dark arts of change management. That thing we always talk about in projects, and all transfer and it doesn't mm. happen. Mm. <laughs> it never happens. But um, anyway, so that's two things. Anyway, I hope that's not a thing. Let me. Uh, I mean, I haven't. I don't think I've taken a breath in fifteen minutes. So what do you what do you what do you think of those? So, the, so first of all, Paul, in all of your writing, the thing that strikes me, and I've just been reading your um, introductory chapter to Truth Wars, which is your book oh. that's coming out in January, which is fantastic. All, all that comes through is your passion and, and your, your desire to actually bring a different perspective on this whole change conversation. Um, and just picking up on a couple of things um, that you mentioned there, which definitely inspired me, this whole thing around um, neo-behaviorism and nudges, um, yes. because that then actually takes change from that pixie dust into more of the, okay, scientific. So actually we do understand a lot more about what helps people change but yeah. we need to get away from this sort of pixie dust um, mentality that has actually got in our way of progressing. Yes, yes. And I think, I think, change, I think I, I, one of the things I think I say that's really very wise is you don't want to ignore the old behaviorism was indifferent to what people thought and felt. Mm. And so you try to change behavior with carrots and sticks. And we still do that today in organizations and with our children and with criminals yeah. and all of that. And, and unfortunately, that's a very old legacy. And it's unfortunate because one of my favorite books that um, you want to, if you haven't read this, jot it down. It's called Punished by Rewards. A marvelous book, which talks not about how sanctions, we know that punishment doesn't work. We know that punishment's coercive and that punishment has adverse consequences. But we think, oh, we'll just use praise or gold stars or financial incentives. Yeah. And in fact, according to Alfie Cohen, who wrote that book, those are just as harmful and just as ineffective in the long run. So we have to need a world between that world of hard behaviorism, old behaviorism, and the world of let's change hearts and minds and pray to God that they change their behaviors. We need something in between. And I think there is stuff in between. But I think we're in new territory. And I think practitioners like you both are out trying stuff out, trying out some of the stuff, checklists, trying out nudges, yeah. trying out, you, you know. And so... Um, and that's it, trying out habit change, trying mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. let's, let's, let's make some micro change to habits. What could we do? What could we do? What, what micro habit could we change around here that might lock, unlock something 
Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, lovely. Charlotte, what do you what do you think? Uh, no, I was just well, I just reflecting on that is one of the things is that um, there's, there's this common thing, change management, who is actually in itself refusing to change. So, um, <laughs> you know, we, we've, we've come across a few people who are um, very much in that, um, you know, we, need, we need, a, need a solid plan and we need to follow that plan in that stepped process and we need to just do communications and we just need to do training mm. and we'll be all right because we've ticked all those boxes um, and we don't actually really need to change because we're actually making progress. And I think it's that, where are we making progress? Because... Um, there may be small pieces of, of, of what you call success, but uh, very often, you know, we talk about habits and organizational habits that actually the organization just goes back to the old habit. Mm -hmm. uh, you might produce it, you might introduce a new piece of software or new processes or restructure, yeah. but the habits are still within the organization. And unless you look at those, um, you might have that new technology um, or that new team, but the, the organization, the system, that it is yeah. with its habits will just shift back to what it's comfortable with. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 As Peter saying, he said, the harder you push at the system, the harder it pushes back. I think mm. Peter has said that. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. I don't think, Oh, I mean, that's another thing that I would wave. If I could have senior leaders learn one thing, the strategist types. Oh, well, I've learned, I haven't learned two things. I haven't learned conflict facilitation skills. I haven't learned this I think systems thinking. I just mm. think, uh, even just causal loop diagrams will help them with problem solving so much better than um, it's just do much better job than they now do at understanding cause and effect. And when you pull a lever in, um, well, in business, in business but, or in society, when you, you intervene in the system, you have a causal model in your mind of what pulling that lever will do. And obviously it, sometimes it's oversimplistic. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I gave the example of a call, a call center, and um, I just think this is mind, mind numbingly stupid. But as soon as there's a sort of performance shortfall in a call center, it usually is something like blame the people. It's not the systems, it's not the marketing, it's not the product, it's not the pricing, it's not the management behavior. You know, if I ask people, list all the things that could be causing this call center to perform like crap. And the first 20 things people name are, to do with the individual motivation or skills or education or bad attitudes or bad beliefs or all this kind of stuff, explain the folks. And then the change manager or the trainer will be brought in. Can you motivate my people mm. or come let's pay them more because <laughs> that will motivate them more, motivate them more. But you're assuming that the causal in the system, the pin that will unlock that stuck system that's performing crap is something to do with personal motivation or personal attitudes. So it could be any number of 30 things. Mm -hmm. But the most convenient thing for you as a boss is to say, well, it's them. Mm -hmm. And you're a trainer. Mm -hmm. Can you come in and fix them yeah. with? And sometimes they're willing to spend big money. Sometimes it'd be half a million dollars, yeah. you know? And, you know, I had a teacher when I started learning some of this stuff back in the back in 1995 and God, he was good. And he said, uh, someone had asked us to do just that very thing. And he said, you know, we're colluding here. I said, mm -hmm. What do you mean? What do you mean, mate? It's a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you know, this guy's got an idea that the only thing that's the problem is, is people are lazy sacks of shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm not sure he's right. And we met with him often enough to know that his behavior was certainly one of the that was awry in the system. But you know, it was a lot of money. I can't remember whether we did it or not. Mm. Uh, so just having people understand cause and effect, that's a cognitive bias called the fundamental attribution error. I mean, you know, if you're trained in psychology, you hear about fundamental attribution error, but not, I don't know that many change people could rattle off, you know, what are the 10 most important cognitive biases yet? Cause it's just not found its way into the canon. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So anyway, those are some random thoughts. Mm. Wow, those are some random thoughts.
So that, that does go to the point about the, the future of change management, doesn't it? Because the, the, the model at the moment, as you say, is sort of a mixture of psych, humanistic psychology and project management. And actually what your book did for me, it repositioned it as more around the sort of the systems thinking, which I was used to, certainly in, in business improvement terms. And Deming obviously talks about systems a lot. Um, and, and also understanding that sort of behavioural economic that neo-behaviorism piece so that suggests to me that future that ma change managers or people who are in the change space in the future really should be looking to um, reskill themselves and learn stuff in that area because that's actually going to serve them better than the old stuff over here yeah yeah well or better or or as well as hmm. Yeah. Have you, you've presumably had some young spark come up to you and say, I want to do change management. How can I learn to be a change manager? Is there a six week program? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I get certified? No, you can do a master's, I mean, master's in organizational behavior and then you should do a two year certification in counseling and then master's in family therapy and system dynamics. I don't know. There's a lot, lot, lot of stuff facilitation i mean it's a long list yeah I think. Um, and not a, not everybody has all of it mm. for sure well, well, I, I certainly probably don't so um, anyway yeah so the strategy part of it you want to talk about the strategy part of it mm. yeah because you, you you do talk about that in the book you say and and again this was a, it was like music to my ears because you talk about really there is a strategy the business strategy and then the tactics that you employ to bring about the change. So yeah. to talk about change strategy is a bit of a sort of a misdirection. Yeah. God, you've read the book thoroughly. <laughs> yeah. That there's some sort of level in the middle, in the middle layer. One of the guys I know is really experienced. Is it sort of like a, almost like a PMO for the whole business? And in Agile, actually, to their credit, they have something called Scagile, that's scaled Agile Frameworks. Mm -hmm. something, like, something like what I have in mind, but there's some layer which coordinates across the organization or across the business unit or across the relative uh, chunk or something like that, all of the different projects and looks at the interlap and the overlaps and dependencies and all of that kind of stuff. You'll be able to assess the change load. Um, so, I mean, I think that, that that's what I think of a strict change strategy is how the big pieces of the puzzle fit together and then so often I've seen and I'm sure you have also is projects that if they don't directly conflict they they nick resources from one another or slightly <laughs> conflicting or, or or you know marketing is running something and and sales or finance is running something and that's not they don't quite conflict but neither do they really align very well mm. uh, it's just they're just hemorrhaging money I mean they're just pissing money away and things like that so what was this woman I met at a party it's one of these things, it was a social gathering in England. She worked for HP and she'd been called on the carpet because she'd been told to make 2,500 people redundant. She has some senior job, I don't know what she was, CLO, CA. You might, I can't remember her name. Actually, Charlotte, I should, um, I should look, I can't remember her name anymore. Anyway, she was HP and she had to make 25 people redundant. redundant. And then, and so she did. Uh, and, then, and then someone came over from California and said, what in blazes is going on? Our headcount costs are skyrocketing. <laughs> and she said, well, we've got all this change happening. We've got this customer service initiative and this marketing initiative and all this kind of stuff. You know what people are doing? They're hiring contractors. Chris, <laughs> <Yeah>. you <laughs> make fire everybody. <laughs> that's yeah. what the the room. <laughs> and I thought that that's a really funny tale about like completely like one hand, just like I have no idea what's happening mm. here. So I thought that was I thought that was interesting, if not that unusual a tale. Yeah. So that's the strange change strategy piece, as I imagine it. Um, yeah. anyway. So actually, Paul, that that also sort of links into a bit around the alignment piece because talking about having that bigger picture view of what's happening in the organisation yeah. um, can actually then maybe help that piece around aligning because, as you said, then there's if you've got projects that are working and actually maybe working against each other or they might not be necessarily actually conflicting but they're causing enough dissonance between different yeah. parts of the organization that that obviously you, you've you the alignment you, you won't get people aligned mm. with that because because you're going to have you know particularly in a 
traditional organisation where you do have the silos um, and the and the different warring factions potentially, um, then that that's a big challenge. So maybe um, what I'm hearing is that if you if you step it up a level and have a much more um, big picture view of the changes that are happening in your organisation, and then you can start to think about what are the consequences also from a systems perspective that that are happening. Then maybe that's that's one way of actually helping with that alignment piece. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I mean, definitely it's a possibility. Although, you know, <laughs> I'm just going to second guess. I mean, you said it much better than I said it. Um, but one of the things that people do a lot is to fix a systemic problem, it happens more in the public sector, is they'll have create a structure, a unit, a committee, a working group, a department, a, or something or other, which is supposed to make bits fit together that aren't working below. So, if someone said that to me as a challenge to my idea, I'd say, you know, I could be fair cocked up, but I can't see another way. I can't see another way of handling the complexity of all that's going on in an organization without having someone in a sense, just mm. having a sight of the whole thing. Um, and the board doesn't, and the executive team doesn't. I mean, they don't know that there's, you know, they don't know what's going on in HR. I mean, you know, they'll know a couple of things. Um, yeah. They don't know what's going on in, you know, Europe, if they're American, or Africa, the African. They don't know what's going on over there. Um, and the other thing is, I don't think most businesses track how much they spend on change and consultants and stuff and what their ROI is. So I've never seen any business produce, like, here's a list of all the changes that we did in 2016. These are all the projects birthed all over the organization and this is how they fared like this bunch over here did pretty good then the margin of error they were great and this bunch over here wow this group down here sucked uh, and this group down here like made things worse <laughs> you know i would love to see that and then yeah. how much do we spent on them and who did them i don't know and and what could we learn as uh, what can our organization learn because right now you can learn generalities from the literature on change management about what works. But I think it'd be more interesting to know specifically what works in your organization, what was actually in the, the particularity of your business, what sorts of changes seem to do well and what seem to don't. And, you know, is it due to size of project or scale of project or who leads it or, it's cross-functional, cross-display, or multi-region, or you know, if you have how much you invest in this or how much you invest in that, try and get some handle on what we do well and what we do well. Because I don't think that, I don't think anybody has the faintest idea. I really mm. don't. Mm. Uh, you know, I mean, I've been I've been pretty high, pretty high in a bunch of businesses. So I haven't really looked. I haven't always been asked to look under the. Um, <laughs> what's the what's the expression of like under the carpet under the carpet or under the bed skirts or whatever it is to see or something like that but talking to them then in my sense of they're no bloody idea about mm. what's up what's going on and and how it's doing i mean obviously they know how the hundred million dollar sap implementation is going but yeah. i'm talking i'm talking about the whole the whole yeah. thing yeah yeah, so yeah. What, what do you think stops organizations from doing that or what what is it that means they aren't doing that that's a good question. <laughs> That's a really good question. Why would I not want to fire? Why would I not want to know? I mean, who owns the whole? I guess is the question. I mean, hmm. you know, well, it should be the board and the senior leadership team. I and mean, who's accountable for the whole? Why did that chief operating officer from HP? go parachuting into London, why didn't he know that one of the kind of consequence of hiring, firing two and a half thousand people and your head can't cost go up? I mean, he must have had kittens. Yeah. Uh, and how could he have known uh, is the question. Um, mm. It's a fine question, you know, Charlotte, I don't have a ready, I don't have a ready mm. answer. What would, be, what would be in the way of people wanting to know or wanting to have that kind of discipline? I mean, there's a scaled agile framework thing going on at Comcast down the road. A very, very able woman running it. I I question she's very, very able, but she's more junior than the big IT 
dudes, and they are dudes, and she's trying to implement something like scaled agile framework light, which requires accountability in a way from all of the, or at least transparency for what's going on in the business. And they're, they kind of fight back. It's mm. kind of interesting. She says she's having a lot of trouble getting them to be transparent about what they're doing and what they're not doing and what they're committed to and what they're not committed to and what their deadlines are and what their deadlines aren't and what resources they're using and what resources they aren't using. She's having trouble getting that kind of transparency because that's what scaled agile framework does is it tries to take all the yeah. same agile stuff that's going on. And yeah. Mm. She's having trouble. So, so could that be about the so system? The you're, you're challenging the system. And as you said, the system always fights back and it self-normalizes. Well, why would some 45-year-old IT project manager dude want to tell a 32-year-old woman in the head office, uh, you know, what he's doing and when he's delivering and by what resource he need and how he's doing and what the dependency does? I mean, no exactly. I'd rather be left alone. Yeah. <laughs> I can understand that. Totally <laughs> understand. Uh, but that's what she's trying to do is try to knit together the whole there, bless her. Yeah, God. She's poking the system. Yeah. yeah, she's having a little poke, that's yeah. for sure. And yeah. what she needs to do that is of course she doesn't have the authority. I and mean, she's very technically able, which is a thirty two year old woman, and these are all, you know, you know, the Typical 40, 40, 45 year old IT bloke kind of dudes, um, you know, they're vice presidents of Comcast, whatever that means, or whatever. I mean, so they think a lot, a lot of themselves. I mean, they're very nice people. I don't want to say they're particularly yeah. out, but, but you know, they've brought, risen to certain things. So they're not, you know, used to thinking, of course, for her to get the information that she requires to do the job she requires to do requires her boss to um, come in and, in a sense, you know, I'll say this, I go to inverted commas, kick some arse, because that's not actually probably what would work. So he, 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 this is kind of interesting, because he wants to delegate. So he wants, in a sense, the least he know, less he knows about people, the more autonomous they are, the more freedom they have, the more liberty they have, the more, you know, the less he's bothered with the day-to-day -day minutia of their things, he just wants results, which is not, you know, an unusual thing for a leader to want, right? I don't mm -hmm. want to hear too much of the noise going on here. Yeah. Leave me alone, give me the big picture. If you can explain in 30 seconds, <laughs> that's good. And so, but he, but he wasn't getting what he wanted in terms of results. So he did okay, well, I don't need to know, but I really don't want to go and get down into the bloody conflicts myself with pe yeah. people, right? And start having, I was, you know, I'm, I'm the guy's coach. So dude, why don't you have like half hour with everybody every week or 45 minutes with everybody every week? And, you know, I mean, he simply refuses so many times. He's busy. Or da, 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 da. Anyway, she was designed, she was brought in to give him the kind of transparency and visibility of his own organization that he doesn't now have. But it's funny because he would have if he was having 45-minute conversations with everybody, mm -hmm. transparency and visibility. But he's brought her in to try and give him transparency and visibility and accountability from his team. Of course, they're telling her to piss off. Mm -hmm. And what they really need, ironically, is for him to have those 45 minutes yeah. you know at least so it's so it's a solution to the, the problem is is he's not being sufficiently accountable for the team results not really paying enough attention to what they're doing to this to the interdependencies and the conflicts and everything like that he's hired someone to do it but the problem has gone away and yeah. it's not in a hurry to go away either so that's <laughs> oh that's not too long when you think, i think i see you knowing it it makes sense to you in some some way that 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 kind of thing yeah, well, it brings someone else in to help solve the problem. That's actually my problem that I need to solve. But um, I, yeah, I don't either feel comfortable or um, yeah. it's just not something that I want to do. Um, so I'll, I, it, it's easier for me to bring someone else in to, to do that on my behalf and I'll hopefully get the same result. Yeah, not I'd like to quit drinking. Will you come do it for me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of like that. Uh, yeah, like that. So, so Paul, it's been um, fantastic um, talking to you. Um, for for people who are listening, um, what? How can they get hold of you? How can they find out what you're up to? Um, where are the places they can go to 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 um, connect with you? Well, if people like it. We should do another one of these at the end of the summer in September or something. I have another chin rag. That'd be fun. I've had. I've enjoyed talking to you. Um, yeah. yeah, it's been good. It's been a lot right. of fun. 
even though it's bloody nine o'clock at night here. Um, it's got very dark. You've got very dark. <laughs> yes, can you see behind me now? Yeah. Uh, very dark, very, very dark. It's like the house is a mess. No, it's <laughs> the house dark. Um, so I'd like to do that. I want to uh, invite people to go to paulgibbons.net. Yep. Um, I, um, I love people to know when Truth Wars comes out so they can evaluate whether it's the sort of book they might enjoy reading. I'm, I'm really excited about it. It might be a stretch for me intellectually. I'm trying to sort of position myself as a public intellectual politics, economics, psychology, the sort of nexus of all of that and the world we need to worry about when we don't have a shared set of facts about how the world is, it's going to be pretty difficult for us to move forward. And so the president, for example, of America said crime rates higher than it's ever been. Well, in fact, it's lower, all time low, more or less, you know, uh, and he says things with just casual disregard for what the truth might be. But I don't want to blame it all on him because there's something in the system which allows mm -hmm. him to be elected. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. the so if he got like 43 million people voted for him, um, despite his obvious character flaws, which to some people are obvious, and um, his liberties with the truth. And so the reason the Aegis for the book is as well, is I was walking around with um, this chap on Halloween night, October 31st, so that would have been a week before the election. And uh, the kids were running away trick or treating in the, in, the, in the distance. And I said, who are you gonna vote for in the election, mate? You know. Uh, knowing he was kind of leaned the other way. And he said, uh, well, I think it's really interesting that the Pope has endorsed Trump. And I said, well, is that a fact? You know, dude, I tell you what, that sounds unlikely. Why don't you go fact check it? And he says, you can't fact check it. The fact checkers are all bent. <laughs> and so that's really like, if, if the world really is like that, if it's really like that, how do we solve problems like global warming? Is the planet hot or is it cool? How do we solve problems like the spread of disease? Is vaccination good for you or bad for you or whatever? How do we, you know, ch tackle the, the sugar and high fructose corn syrup? How do we agree about genetically modified foods? How do we agree, you know, I mean, all these things have some basis in science. It's not the science is always right. We don't really have anything better. Um, and so that that's really my passion is that what do we do about this and that's why I'm going to have a go at writing Truth for us. So that's, that's me. That's my bit. Yeah, brilliant. And there is a chapter on your website that people can read as a tempter. <laughs> yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, we'll definitely... I've, studied, I've been studying tobacco, so I know, I'm, I'm, I know we want to stop. I've been studying tobacco. So half a million people die a year from tobacco. Wow. And about 150 million people have died this... Um, uh, over the last 50 years from tobacco. 500,000 a year die in the United States. So it kills millions worldwide. Millions. Yeah. Millions of people. Terrorism, few thousands. It's grotesque, it's ugly, it's horrible. It's in the thousands. Tobacco in the millions. Yeah. So if you had a, I, I've been doing thought experiments thinking that if there was a food on the grocery store shelf next to the orange juice that killed millions of people of cancer, lung cancer it wouldn't be on the shelves very long no. i don't care if it was a pharmaceutical product say it did something for obesity or some other chronic condition that's very hard alzheimer's but it gave millions of people cancer well it wouldn't be on the market so nothing that gives millions of people cancer is tolerable even if it does lots of good things and uh so here we go we've had hundreds of years uh, in 1964 there was a proclamation that cancer category was caused by cigarette smoking and it's 50 years on and we've still not you know mm -hmm. so and it's an extraordinary thing if you think about it like how is that yeah. how do we create a world where that's possible when we just stop myself so that's my that's my truth wars spiel i could go on and on sorry yeah. i'm sorry no, about no. that, that i'm with you on that i'm on the, on the fructose front and that you know <laughs> the, the canes you know and, uh, the corn syrup because you know that again that that mm. is you know, science is now showing how that is um, killing people yeah. Um, yeah. and and putting huge stresses on 
healthcare systems and yeah. and also the devastation to families and everything like that where it's and it's a it's a food it's in food you know and what are, what are we doing to allow that because it is actually killing people <laughs> it, it is it is so yeah, yeah so, so interesting stuff so let's have more uh let's um i know i could go on and on and on but anyway it's really it's really been great connecting with you for the first time charlotte and yeah uh, we've chatted a bit. But. We have, yes. And I'm sure we'll, we'll chat even more. And um, definitely look forward to doing this again later on in the year. All right. Push stop before I say it. <laughs> Thanks very much. That's Paul Gibbons. Thank you for joining us today.